The desire to seem well-read afflicts even the most principal reader, secretly, if not openly. We line up our books, rearrange them thoughtfully, but in a manner that suggests a casual carelessness. What this? Oh, you know, it's just David Foster Wallace's 1,000-page infinite jest. I was reading it in the bath. We want to make good impressions on people. And why not? Impressions matter. Books convey our value, our cultural capital, even our romantic suitability. To quote the filmmaker John Waters, the eminently quotable Oscar Wilde of our time, if you go home with somebody and they don't have books, don't f*** them. This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature, with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, Episode 6, How to Cure Yourself with Reading. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and today's topic is Bibliotherapy, or Literary Remedies for the Mind and Body. As Ella Berthold and Susan Nelderkin write, they are the authors of The Novel Cure, published in 2013, a clever reference book of mental and physical ailments that readers can treat by reading novels, which offer either cure or consolation. From a broken heart to a broken leg, some of the ailments they include are serious, like addiction, depression, or bad taste, while others are light-hearted, fear of filing your taxes, desire to be a superhero, suffering a wardrobe crisis. Each also includes cross-references. Within the entry on breaking up, for instance, you also are pointed to fear of commitment and seeking vengeance. Novels either show you how misguided you've been, write Berthold and Elderkin, or they reassure you that you're not alone. This pair has also authored a wonderful companion volume for young readers called The Story Cure, which addresses serious problems like teenage pregnancy and planetary ruin, but also lighter ones like fixations on princesses or ponies. And that's just the peas. Speaking of which, the two volumes of The Poetry Pharmacy by William Seagart does just the same for loneliness, grief, restlessness, and a host of other ailments. But it prescribes and reprints individual poems. But we'll concentrate today on the novel cure starting with its first principles, that reading the right novel at the right time will cure or console you, and then we'll look to three treatable ailments. Berthold and Elderkin are that rare breed of reader who curates and recommends book to other, books to others, who fill psychical demands with imaginative supplies. The fact is, they write, one simply cannot hope to read every book that exists. Extreme selectivity is the only solution. Of course it is, but which books do we select? We could rely on the bestseller lists, the prize winners, the latest reviews in newspapers, or God help us, Amazon, the crowdsourced recommendations maybe on sites like Goodreads. We can subscribe to newsletters like Shelf Awareness or Books in the Media, we could ask our friends, or we could browse the shelves. The trouble is that none of those books are tailored specifically for your particular needs and conditions, for the moment you find yourself in. They also lean heavily toward recent books, ignoring illimitable numbers of past books. The point is that your needs change constantly with time. To quote Bertold and Elderkin again, a good book read at the right moment should leave you uplifted, inspired, energized, and eager for more. Each of us can think of a novel we read at precisely the right moment in our lives, the one that spoke to us, the one that nudged our emotional trajectories ever so slightly, the one that told us we weren't alone, the one that opened our eyes to experiences we'd never conceived. My list is different from yours, just as your list three years hence will be different from today's. Conversely, each of us can name books that others, say parents, friends, or teachers, insisted or required that we read at a given moment, that we just hated or didn't get. 
We might feel guilty that we failed to meet those opportunities, but the failing wasn't necessarily in us. It might also have been in the book itself, which was unsuited to who we were at the time. We read it too late or too early. So how do you find the right book for the right moment? First, surrender yourself to serendipity. You will read the right book at the right time because you're lucky. And you never know which ones you'll miss because you're unlucky. Okay, you say, but randomness isn't a strategy. What do I do to be deliberate about my selections? My only piece of advice in this episode about other people's advice is to be open to the possibility of every book you read. Then the right books will find you, even the most unobliging to give up their kernels of wisdom that take hard digging to crack. As William Wordsworth says about nature, bring with you a heart that watches and receives. So what advice do Berthold and Elderkin offer? Theirs is tailored to particular ailments, so let's look at three. As Winston Churchill has said, depression is the black dog that tails you. For those of us who suffer from it, we need a novel that can accompany us into our dark, melancholic place, acknowledging and articulating it, as Berthold and Elder can write. They are careful to add that bibliotherapy is very unlikely to be enough to treat depression, but alongside stronger interventions, or in cases of mild depression, reading a book that either takes you out of your funk, as they write, or joins you in it, can be therapeutic. Milan Kundera's The Unbearable Lightness of Being and Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar offer protagonists to accompany you, while Winifred Watson's Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day, an author I confess I'd never heard of, or Gary Steingart's Absurdistan, which I want to read just for the title, will cheer you up. Another ailment, or is it an ambition, that Berthold and Elderkin offer to treat is this. The desire to seem well-read afflicts even the most principal reader, secretly, if not openly. We line up our books, rearrange them thoughtfully, but in a manner that suggests a casual carelessness. What this? Oh, you know, it's just David Foster Wallace's 1,000-page Infinite Jest. I was reading it in the bath. We want to make good impressions on people. And why not? Impressions matter. Books convey our value, our cultural capital, even our romantic suitability. To quote the filmmaker John Waters, the eminently quotable Oscar Wilde of our time, if you go home with somebody and they don't have books, don't f*** them. Berthold and Elderkin's list includes titles just obscure enough to suggest that you've read many more, that your shelves are lined with similar others. Moby Dick and War and Peace are there, of course, but so are lesser knowns. I'll confess, I'd never heard of Patrick White's Voss. But I've just ordered a copy of Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain. Time for a quick digression. If you're looking for ways to shortcut this whole process, first, I'll caution you that it is a dangerous game. You'll be on really thin ice when you claim to have read something, and then you meet the person who actually has, who can call your bluff. But a few years ago, the French philosopher Pierre Bayard wrote a playful yet useful book titled How to Talk About Books You Have Not Read, which, ironically enough, I have. In essence, Bayard says that each reader retains a unique set of memories and impressions of each book, so you can freely claim to remember different things about a book. Just be sure your memorized summary doesn't come from the film adaptation or from Wikipedia, or you'll be sunk. Lethargy is the third and final ailment that we'll consider here. It means inertia or languor or a dull lack of motivation. The cure is an electrifying tonic of adventures, not just a book of hijinks and thrills, but a model for being more adventuresome, like Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote, who is both restless and reckless in his search for adventure. 
He escapes from a dull, conventional life into a world of delusional imagination. Quixote isn't a model for how to live, but a shot of adrenaline for all of us who do as we're told, who settle for less, who aspire to nothing more than a paycheck, a big screen television, and a lawnmower in the suburbs. Consider also the cure for zestlessness, the ailment that closes this book. E.L. Doctorow's rollicking novel, Ragtime, set in a world of early 20th century America, bursting with inventions and possibilities. Or so I'm told. I haven't read it, but now I want to. Berthold and Elderkin call it the cure for a life of deadened, flattened senses, without an appetite for new experiences, for the edge that makes life thrilling. What all of these books have in common is a sense of curiosity of the transformational potential lying latent in books, if only we open them and open ourselves to them. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is the third in a seven-part series on John Milton's Paradise Lost, in which Satan arrives at the Garden of Eden. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash U-L-L-Y-O-T. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, U-L-L-Y-O-T at ucalgary.ca. That's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. (music) 